بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله تعالى وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت عليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وقد نوينا أتعلم تعليم وتذكر وتذكير ونفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة نبيه والدعاء إلى الهداء والدلالة على خير وكل ما نواه مشايخنا ابدعاء وجه الله وثوابه وقربه اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا يا كريم الحمد لله in our first lesson of Hanafi fiqh in the the دورة الصيفية followed by as was begun from by Sayyid al-Habib Omar bin Muhammad bin San Hafid in the city of, blessed city of Tareem. And generally, before starting any class, right, there would be an encouragement right, of renewing of one's intentions. Right? And intentions, as the Prophet, as is ascribed to the Prophet as having said, right, المؤمن خير من عمله, that the, the intentions of the believer are often better than their actions itself. Right? Because with one, with one action, one can have multiple intentions. Right? And right, as for intentions for studying the uh, fiqh or the sacred law uh, of Islam, right, it's important that we have uh, the basic intention, one, to learn, but second, also to practice. Right, because in the malaimu lilamali bihi, because knowledge, the point of knowledge, is to practice upon it. Right? Knowledge is not sought in and of itself; but it is sought as a means to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right? And the Prophet sallallahu he said very beautifully. He said, "Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman, zahar Allahu lahu tariqan ilal jannah." That whoever travels a path, right, salaka tariqan. Seeking in that path knowledge, right? Meaning that the, the path, right? When we hear about a path, we know that the path has an end, it has a goal, as a destination, right? But in the hadith, it says, that in the, in the midst of that path, they seek knowledge, and right? then Allah will facilitate for them a path to Jannah, right? And this, this hadith, if we were to take time on it, so it has so many meanings. Right, that are very beautiful. Right, we just very shortly will take out a few important things that, that apply to our lesson today, right, to fiqh. Right, the Prophet said, Salaka tariqan. Right, he didn't say, Safara right, ala tariqan. He didn't say right, that he didn't say just traveling a path, but he used specifically the word salaka, which comes from the word suduk. Right, salaka right, is a type of travel right, that uh, indicates like, a following of something else right? because the silk is a necklace, a beaded necklace. Right? So there's one bead after another, after another, and they're all connected. Right? So salaka right, has an indication in its meaning right, to that chain of transmission to the Prophet وسلم, that it's not just a person traveling their own path, right? but they're traveling a specific path that has been Right, set by those before us, right? And similar, the word tariqan, man sadaka tariqan, whoever uh, travels a path. And the word here, path, right, from the word taraka means a trodden path, a path that others before you, before us, have journeyed. Right. So it's very important that once knowledge is founded and grounded in that chain of transmission back to the Prophet وسلم, because the religion was preserved right, and is being preserved right, by divine guidance right, by people right, who have upheld this prophetic legacy right, both in action, knowledge, and in character. Right? So the prophetic legacy is not just information but it's information coupled with its knowledge, coupled with true understanding of that knowledge and, and applying that knowledge as well. Right. So we'll be taking the, the, our continuing lessons right, on a book by, which, which was translated by Sheikh Faraz Khan, 
Hafizahullah Ta'ala, which is called Ascent to Felicity. Right? And if anyone can get the PDF or the actual physical copy, then uh, they can follow along. It is, it's a translation of a, uh, an early work by uh, Abu Al-Ikhlas Ash-Shurun Baladi, alayhi rahmatullahi ta'ala, one of the great Hanafi jurists of the earlier centuries. Right? And it's, uh, it's a very beautiful work. It's, it's simple but uh, it's not lacking in anything, right? So our hopes in this class is to cover at least purification and prayer at the very least. And we want to try to leave room for questions uh, at the end of each class, inshallah ta'ala, right? So uh, when we talk about purification uh, in the Hanafi school, right? As well as other schools, but in general, in Islam, Right, there's two main parts to the purification, right? right? And if one wants to take it even a further overview of it, that purification is broken into two parts. That one is the uh, purification of the heart. And that is the most important of all purification. And the purification of the heart, right? That entails removing from the hearts the filthy, blameworthy characteristics of the ego and of the lower self, right? Because arrogance, right? Uh, greed, right? hatred, rancor, right? ostentation, love of praise, love of worldliness, right? And so forth. These are, these are considered impurities of the heart, right? And they, right? and part of our path toward a relation, a stronger relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to re realizing ourselves in true servant, servanthood with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entails that we remove from our hearts that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, in Allah la yanduru ila suwirikum wa ila ajzadikum, that Allah does not look at your bodies nor does he look at your forms. But I can yanduru ila qudubikum wa amalikum. Rather, he looks at your hearts and your actions, right? So if the heart is the place upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gazes, right? Then how much more importance should we give to beautifying that right, over our outward, right? So that's, that's one aspect of purification, which you will take in other classes, right? Throughout this dawra, right? Like the roha of Sayyid Habib Omar, as well as right, for other classes that are coming up. Right, but our discussion talks on the second type of purification, which is purification of the body. Right, uh, right. So uh, purification, it, uh, it applies, right, this outward purification applies to two things. One is the removal of actual filth, right? Physical, tangible filth, which would be, for instance, like blood, urine, semen, and feces, right? alcohol, uh, and the likes. Right, that they must be in order to pray, in order for one to be able to pray the prayer, uh, they must remove from their body, from their clothing, and from the place of prayer, right, any of these impurities. Right, and we'll talk about how much is uh, how much of it is excused coming up. Right, but the second type of uh, is a ritual impurity. That if a person does not have wudu, then they are in a state of ritual impurity, right? Minor, minor ritual impurity, which is also known as hadith. Uh, but if they are in need of a ghusl, a ritual bath, and we'll talk about what causes one to need a ghusl, uh, then they are in a major state of ritual impurity. Right? Neither of them, right, in the minor state of ritual impurity nor a major state of ritual impurity, can one pray. Right? One must be free from all ritual impurity, right? And must remove all physical impurity in order to pray, right? So this purification is a condition for the prayer, right? And some, it's a condition for other things as well, right? So in regarding the wudu, which is right, how one removes the minor ritual impurity, right? The wudu, uh, the word wada actually comes from the word uh, to illuminate, to give light to something. Right? And the virtues of wudu are immense. And the Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned in many a hadith the virtues of making wudu. Right? And on top of that, not just making the wudu, 
right? But also, right, to constantly keep oneself in the state of wudu. The Prophet he said that la yuhafizu al wudu illa al mu'min. Right? No one strives to preserve their wudu except for the true believer. Right? And, and what that means is that whenever they break their wudu, they, they immediately make it again so that they that they are constantly in a state of purity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. And so how does one do it? Right? First, we have to look at what are the integrals of the wudu. Right? And the integral, which is the fard, that, that which is obligatory of the wudu, is the bare minimum that if one were to do it, they would be considered to have wudu. If they were to miss any point of these integrals, any one of these integrals, then their wudu would not be considered valid. Right? They cannot pray, they cannot touch the mushaf, and so forth. Right? So there are four things that one must accomplish in order to be considered to have wudu. Right? Above and beyond that, we have the sunnah of the Prophet right? And we'll, we'll talk about that in its place. Right? That the four integrals of wudu is first washing the face, right? washing the face. Right? And the, the face is defined as nas, that which one once stands at a, a distance at a normal distance from a person and they, at a speaking distance, uh, what can be seen of the face, right? So what you can see of my face right now, that would be the limits of the face, right? So, so it'll be from the hairline, right? Down to the bottom of the, the chin where the bone stops and from one ear lobe or from the ear to the next ear, right? And it's very important that the space between the, the side burn and the ear be covered as well, be washed. Right, so that the face, the first integral is that the face, the entire face is washed. Right, so if you were to draw a border around, it would, right, the whole circle, the circumference of the face has to be covered. Every uh, portion of the face has to be washed. Right, and with the exclusion of the inside of the eye. Right, and so and that that is very important. Right, and for instance, uh, if a person were to make wudu and they were to keep their eyes very close, right? So uh, the spaces of the eyelid may not get water there. So one should be careful to make sure that water reaches every place, right? And the, the basis of water is that it reaches, and it reaches even the smallest uh, places, right? So uh, one should not have any doubts of whether the water reached or not, right? As long as they use it as long as they washed it in a reasonable reasonable way, right? So, so that's the first of the four, right? The second of the four is that they, to wash both arms up to and including the elbows, to wash both arms up to and including the elbows, right? So that the arm would be considered from the tip of the finger to the elbow, but including the elbow as well. Right. So the elbow being made up of three bones, right? Two on the side, one on the top, all of that must be washed, right? As well, in order for the wudu to be valid. Right. The third is to wipe one fourth of the head. One fourth of the head. Right. And so if one were to take this amount, it would be one fourth of the head, right? One, two, three, four. Right. So two on the side, two on the top, that would be one fourth. Uh, any one fourth of the head would suffice, right? But it has to be the head that is above the ears, right? So even if one's hair on the back of their neck were to go down below their ears, right, that is not considered the top, the head that one can wipe on. That's actually considered what's called the qafa in Arabic, the nape, right? The back of the neck, right? So so that's the third of the fourth. One just takes a wet, a wet hand, right? put some water on their hand, a wet hand, and just passes it over that portion. Right? If one does not have hair, then they can wipe directly on their head. Right? But one fourth of the head is the minimum. Right? In other schools, right, they, they, they have differed in the amount of the wiping. Right? The Hanafi method takes one fourth because of the hadith of al Muhira bin Shu'aba, where they say that the Prophet that he that he made wudu and he wiped over the forelock, the front fourth of the of his head. 
right? And last, the final of the, the integrals, right, is that one washes uh, their feet, both feet up to and including the ankles, right? Up to and including the ankles. So if someone does these four things, they wash their face, their entire face, their arms up to the elbows, both arms, right? They wipe one fourth of their head and they, wipe, they wash both feet up to and including the ankles. They are in a state of ritual purity. They are in a state of wudu. Right. Uh, there are two. There are two conditions that are found in other schools that are not in the Hanafi school. So, for instance, the intention. Right? The intention of the wudu is not an obligation in the Hanafi school, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that all actions are based on the intentions, right? And uh, and that is understood to apply to those acts of worship, which are not just a means towards something else, right? Even though wudu is an act of worship, right? But it is sought, it is saw as a means to be able to pray the prayer, right? So the prayer, you need an intention for it to be valid. But the wudu, the wudu, the wudu will be valid if all of these four things become what? So if, if you're walking down the street and someone pushes you into a pool, right? Guarantee you have wudu. Right? You have wudu, right? Even though you didn't intend the wudu, right? But the, in order to be rewarded for the action of doing wudu, Right? One has to have an intention in order to get the reward. Right? But if one did the entire wudu without an intention, then it would be valid. Right? And honestly, right, as one of the great early Muslim scholars uh, mentioned, he says that it's almost inconceivable that anyone does a voluntary action and doesn't have an intention. Right? Because an intention is in the heart. It's not what we say. So if someone rolls up their sleeves and takes off their hat and goes to the restroom, and turns on the water, right? All of that is an intention. What if someone to poke or to tap you on the shoulder at that moment and say, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? Or excuse me, miss, what are you doing? Right? Immediately you would say, I'm making wudu, right? There's no need to say, I am making wudu. Right? So no one should get caught up about the intention. Right? So intention is what in the heart. But if someone pushed you in a pool, then, then you can say that there was no intention, but it would still be valid in the Hanafi school. Right, but that is the bare minimum, right? And the Prophet said, he, he gave us instructions on how to do things beautifully, right? how to beautify our actions for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And this is the aspect that one who is serious in their religion and serious in trying to, to, to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they should not suffice with just performing things at their bare minimum but rather they should try their best to inculcate right, the sunnah of the Prophet in that thing so that it's beautified, right? And that because the point of the worship is not just to do it, right? It's that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with it and accepts it, right? So by means of incorporating the sunnah of the Prophet in, these, in our, our acts of worship, right, it's a beautification of that worship. It's more readily accepted by Allah, it's more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so, so we're gonna talk about the emphasized sunnahs of the, right? the emphasized sunnahs are that which the Prophet some he constantly did and he rarely left unless he had an excuse, right? He rarely left these out, right? So the first is the intention. So the intention in the Hanafi school is considered a sunnah of the wudu. And if one makes the intention, they will be rewarded for the wudu. Right? If they don't, then there is uh, the wudu is still valid, but they do not. It is not uh, rewarded. Right? Number two is to use the siwak, right? the tooth stick, which is a small, uh, which is a stick which the Prophet used to use to brush his teeth. Now the tooth stick is a sunnah, right? Uh, there's two sunnahs involved. One is to use the actual tooth stick. Right, because that's the sun, what's exactly what the Prophet used. But the second is al istiyak, right? To actually clean the mouth. Right? Cleaning of the mouth is the sunnah of the Prophet. Uh, yes, inshallah. Questions will be taken at the end, inshallah, for the last 10 minutes or so. Right, so uh, when we talk, regarding the, the siwak, there's two types of sunnah, right? There's two parts of it. Right? One is to use the actual tooth stick, right? Because uh, that's what the Prophet used, right? Uh, but the second is the cleanliness of the mouth that is achieved by that. 
right? So one, if one used the toothbrush or any other means to clean their mouth, right? They would obtain one sunnah, right? They would ab obtain that first, right? The cleaning of the mouth, but using the actual tooth stick is another sunnah as well. Uh, you, saying the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the wudu uh, is a sunnah of the Prophet and in any honorable action that we do, we should say the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And these are things that the Prophet is giving us, these tips and guidelines that the Prophet is giving us to cause our heart to constantly be in remembrance of Allah. And one of the best means of that is to use the word, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bismillah. Enter your house, Bismillah. You leave your house, Bismillah. You, you, you leave the restroom, Bismillah. Right? You, you, you change your clothes, Bismillah. Right? You eat, Bismillah. Drink, Bismillah. Right? To, to constantly remind the heart to, to remember of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a hadith which is narrated by right, which is narrated by many scholars in their books that, that every matter of importance that is not begun with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is cut off from blessing. Right? To, to start bismillah. Right? Uh, it doesn't have to be any specific method of saying bismillah. Right? Some scholars have liked right, saying bismillah al azim walhamdulillah ala deen al islam. Right. But that is right, uh, is not a necessity, right? just by saying Bismillah. Right? If you want to do that, that's good as well. That's very beautiful. Uh, of, of the emphasized Sunan, right? in total, the author, he lists 17. Right? So number four, so one being the intention, two being the, the tooth stick, the siwak, three being the name, mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four will be washing the hands up to and including the wrist at the beginning of the wudu. So to first start by washing the hands up to and including the wrist. Right. We mentioned that the farad is to wash the whole arm uh, up to and including the elbow, right? But if right, to start the wudu by washing the wrist, right? Uh, washing the hands up to the wrist three times, right? And any time that washing the hands is a sunnah, right? The sunnah is, apply, is applies to washing the hands three times up to the wrist. Right? So, for instance, part of the sunnah is to wash their ha one's hands before eating, right, and after eating. Right. So, the sunnah would would be fulfilled by washing three times up to the wrist, right? even if one is only going to eat with the the right hand. Right. Same thing afterwards. Right. Not just merely the right hand or just a few fingers. Right. The full sunnah is applies to three times up to the wrist whenever washing the hands is a sunnah. Right. Uh, number five right, is to maintain the correct order of the limbs as is mentioned in the verse of the Quran. Right. So to do everything in order. Right. We talked about the four integrals right, and those are the four that are mentioned in the verse of pure purification in the Quran. Uh, which Allah SWT says that, oh, you who believe when you intend to pray, right, then wash your faces right, and your arms up to the wrist, up to and including the wrist, wipe your heads and wash your feet up to and including the ankles. Right? So those four are mentioned in the, the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right? So to do everything in order, right? to wash the face before the arms, then arms before the wiping, wiping before the feet. Right? If one did it out, and out of order, the, it would still be valid. It is still valid, uh, as opposed to some other schools where they said that the, the order is an obligation. For us, the order is not an obligation. Right? It is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to do so. Right? One is rewarded for doing it, right? but it's still valid if it's left out. So for instance, someone uh, uh, forgot or skipped washing their arms and they white washed their face then they wiped and they washed their feet then they realized and then they they can go back and wash their arms they don't have to repeat the entire wudu right but it's important to note that to to leave these the emphasized sunnas right, without any excuse right is disliked Right. If it's constantly done, if it's made a habit, the constantly leaving out the emphasized sunnah right, with no excuse, then it could be sinful. It could become sinful. Right. Uh, number six, 
is continuity, right? Meaning that that one doesn't take breaks in between the wudu. That they wash their face, then they go have a cup of tea, then they come back, they wash their arms, then they go have some biscuits, right? That that one should do all of it in one in, in one go, right? Such that the the first limb washed is not dry by the time one reaches the end of the wudu. Right, obviously excluding like situations like person has dry skin, so they need to dry their they need to dry the water first, right? That that's not a problem. Or they're standing in the hot sun, so by the time they get to their feet, their face is already dry. That's not against the sunnah, right? But it is right, to do everything continuously without too much delay, without unnecessary delay. If it's a small delay, you have to someone's asking, Are you ready? You just say, Yes, I'm ready. That's not that does not go against the continuity of the wudu. Uh, and apologies, but in, in the beginning, and things are just a list, right? And, right? and, and these, are, these are important lists, right? So if one is noticing these down, it's good, right? But things are mentioned as a list and then they are expounded on later on, right? So number seven, for those who are keeping number, uh, is to wash the limbs that are mentioned that have to be washed, like the integrals, the face, the arms, and the feet, right? That to do that not only once, but three times, right? So if one were to get water on all of the parts of the circumference of the face one time, that suffices for the, for the integral, for the, uh, for the four integrals, just to get water on all of those parts, to wash all of those parts one time. Right. But the sunnah is to do it three times. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he demonstrated to the companions. And he, he made an entire wudu, washing everything only once. And he said that, wudu la salat illa bihi. And This is the wudu that Allah will not accept a salat except by this, right? by this type of wudu. Meaning that's the minimum. That's the integrals. Right. Then he did another wudu again. Right, washing everything twice, and he said, That this is the wudu of the person who gets double reward. Right? And then he did uh, another wudu a third time, and right? washing everything three times. And he said, That this is my wudu and the wudu of the prophets before me. Right, so to wash three times is the sunnah of the prophets of the already said, right. So to wash the face three times, to wash the arms three times, the feet three times, right? But as regarding the wiping, the wiping is only once, right? The wiping is only once. Uh, number eight, right? And these are not really in order, uh, is to rinse out or wash the entire mouth three times. So to take water with the right hand, to bring it into one's mouth and to swish it around for lack of a better word. Right, and then to spit it out and to do that three times. Right? Again, this is all preparation to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The same, right? again, number nine would be to do the same thing for the nose. To take some water, to lightly sniff it into the nose to, to, so that it gets to the point where the nose becomes hard, where the cartilage starts. Right? If it hurts, you've gone too far and there's no need to go into extremes. Right? Someone... They do, they wipe, and it goes all the way to their brain, right? That is not some of the prophets that I some to cause pain to yourself, right? To do it gently so that the soft parts of the nose are washed, right? And then to blow out, right, with the assistance of the left hand, because the left hand is used for uh, just right, things that are not honorable, right? Number 10 uh, applies to someone who has a, a beard, right? So to take water, and to run it through the beard, right, is sunnah of the Prophet But even though the hair of the beard hangs below the circumference of the face, so there's no, it's not a necessity to wash, right, the skin that is not directly attached to the, to the face, the hair. So like, for instance, this hair is obligatory to wash because it's, it's part of the face, right? If the beard hangs low, to, wa to wipe that part by taking water, either this way or by this way. Right, to take some water in the hand and to to interlace one's fingers through the through the hair of the beard, and right, that is the sunnah of the Prophet But right, if the part of the beard comes on on the face on the 
within the diameter of the face, right? Then uh, if you can see through it to the skin, it's obligatory to make the water reach the skin under the hair, right? Which is not difficult because water reaches right, even the smallest of places. But if the beard is very thick that you cannot see the skin under it, then you merely just have to you know, wet the outside of the, you have to wash the outside of that beard. You don't have to make sure that water gets in deep inside, right, in the wudu. Okay, continuing. We want to make sure to leave time for questions. Uh, continuing, and uh, number 11 is to run one's wet fingers between the fingers and the toes. All right, so interlacing the fingers right, of the hand, right? And for the toes, so when regard, with regards to the toes, right? So you're gonna take the left, the small finger of the left hand and run it through each toe of the, of the right foot, then the left foot, right? Uh, all the way to, from one of the small toe to the small toe of the other of the left foot. Right, so that is sunnah as well. Right, and that can be done from above or from below. The, the point is to get it done. Okay, number 12 is to wipe the entire head. Right? So instead of just sufficing with one fourth, which would, be, which would fulfill the obligation right, to, to wipe the entire head right? one time. Right. So to wipe the entire head one time, right, would suffice. Right. Right. Also to wipe the ears using the same water. Right. So if I were to demonstrate this, right, how one can do that, right. uh, let me just, if I were to take, for instance, that if one were to wet their hand, they could wipe all the way into the back, take their hands to the side, and then put their fingers inside the folds of their ear and then the thumb to the back of the ear, right? That's the, the full, right? To, so the ears are wiped and the entire head is wiped, right? But the, the, the method is not as important as just doing it, right? So if one just, and they, and they were to do however, without any specific method, that's also fine because there's, the method is not mentioned in the hadith, right? But the wiping of the entire head, some things of the method are mentioned that the Prophet would go from the back all the way to the front, from the front all the way to the back, right, including the nape. Right, so uh, number 13 is to, to actually use the hand to guide the water when, when washing. Right, so and he, he calls it rubbing here. In Arabic, it's delic. Right, so if one is washing their face, technically, if you were to put your face under the shower head, Right, and all of it gets wet, then you have that, that suffices for the obligation. But to actually use your hand to guide the water right, is the sunnah of the Prophet. And it's a very, it's an emphasized sunnah. Right? And according to the Maliki school, it's an obligation of the, of the wudu. Right? So it, it's good to, to, to keep oneself away from differences of opinion right? because that which is sought from us as slaves of Allah is to fulfill our responsibilities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that we are certain that it's done properly, right? So if one were to, to do the delk, right? It's a sunnah in the Hanafi school, right? But even according to the Maliki school, their, their wudu would be valid. And that's an important, even though, uh, and that would be recommended to do out of caution, right? But it's not obligatory and it's not sinful to leave, right? Unless one constantly leaves it right? out of habit, right? becomes habitual in leaving it. Right, like all the other emphasized sunnahs. Right, uh, quickly we'll finish this list. So number 14 is to start whenever one is washing something that has two parts, right, to start with the right. So when washing the arms, we have to wash both arms. To start with the right arm first, right, is sunnah, right? And when I'm washing the feet, to wash the right foot first, right? Washing the hands, to wash the right hand first. Right, so that only applies to things that have two that they're washing two things at once, right? To start with the right first. Uh, say the Aisha, she narrates that Canon Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fi umurihi. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to love to start from the right side in all of his matter, his affairs, meaning all of his praiseworthy affairs. So he said, Hatta She said, Hatta 
uh, that even in his purification, meaning in wudu, okay, so we see that it's a sunnah mentioned here, right? But also in combing his hair and putting on his shoes, that he would start with the right side. Right? And the no one loves the Prophet وسلم, right? more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if the Prophet is loved by Allah, then our emulation of the Prophet وسلم, is the best means for us to acquire Allah's love. Right? Number 15, to start with the tips of the fingers and the toes when washing the arms and the feet. Right? So when washing one's arm, technically you could wash elbow down, right? but it's sunnah to start from the, the fingertips down to the elbow. Because Allah says to wash the hands up to the elbow, which would, which would imply that one starts from here and stops at the elbow, right? In, including the elbow. Right? Same thing with the toes. Allah says wash the feet up to the ankles. Right, so to start from the toes is the sunnah. Right? But making sure that all of that is washed is the obligation, right? Whether one starts from the elbow down or up, it's still valid. Right? And he says, number 16, starting with the front of the head when wiping it. Right? So wiping one fourth of the head, the, the entire head is sunnah. Right? To start from front to back right, is a, a separate sunnah. So if one did back to front, Right, the whole head, they would get one sunnah, but they would have left the other. Right, and then number 16, to wipe the back of the neck. Right, to wipe the back of the neck. So we, the hadith narrates that the Prophet would wipe from the front of his forehead to the back, all the way down to the back of his neck. Right, right, to his, the nape of his neck. Right, but not the throat. Right, to wipe the throat is not a sunnah in the Hanafi school. Right, so, uh, because of the, the next section is important, and we will uh, we will take that. But if there are any quick questions about that, I just want to make sure that that was uh, understood, right? So that the, the obligations being four, right, the, the remaining seventeen things, right, being a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu which is extremely rewarding. Um, I believe one of the, okay, come on. Okay, so the sunnah mu'akkada, the emphasized sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is that which the Prophet وسلم, did, and he, he, he constantly did, he made a habit of doing it uh, without uh, leaving it unless he had an excuse, right? It's very rare that he left these things unless there was an excuse, right? So, uh, so if for one to to constantly leave out the sunnah mu'akkada, right, would be sinful, right? But to leave once or once in a while with no excuse, right, here and there, occasionally, right, is not necessarily sinful, but it's disliked, right? But if someone had an excuse, for instance, it's very cold. Right, or, uh, or they have very little time before the prayer, right? or, they, or generally they have less, they don't have enough water, they're traveling, right? and whatever the situation may arise, if there's a, an excuse, right? a valid excuse, then it's not sinful for them to leave. Right? So there, there's a wisdom in, in us in understanding what is the minimum requirement and how do we, and then what is above and beyond that. Right? So, there are other sunnahs of the Prophet وسلم, re regarding the wudu, right? But they are sunnahs that he did sometimes and sometimes he didn't do it, right? So they're not as emphasized as others, right? They are recommended to do. If one did it, they would be rewarded, right? Uh, if one did not do it, uh, they, would not, they would not have any sin, even if they did it without an excuse or they never, even if it was habitual. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a question about the method of wiping the head. Uh, some of the scholars, they've mentioned a specific method, right? And, and they've deemed that to be good, a good way to fulfill the sunnah. But it, it specifically is not sunnah. Right? It's not from the prophet to do it this specific manner, right? It is from the prophet to wipe the entire head and the ears, right? Including the back of the neck, right? Which is indicated in the hadith as well, right? But some scholars, Many of the early scholars, actually, many of the early scholars, 
they've deemed it good to use this method. So what we'll, what we'll do is they would break their finger, their hands into a few different parts. So the hands are wet, right? That we will take this part, right? The three fingers that are attached, right? And they would write with it the from the front of the head all the way to the back, right? right? Keeping the rest of the hand off, right? Separate, right? So as not to take the water away from those parts, right? And then second, that on the way back to use the palms for the side of the head. So now we have completely with this part and this part, we have completely covered the entire head. So on to the back and then from the sides to the front, right? And then to use the finger inside the ear, going around the fold of the ear and then the thumb for the back, right? So by that, you've we've wiped the entire head, which is one sunnah. We've wiped all of the ears, which is the same sunnah, right? And we've done all of that with new water for each thing. So it's not used Otherwise, if we use your whole hand and the water might dry up before going to the ears. Right? And then last, the scholars have recommended also to use the back uh, portion of these three fingers for the back of the neck. Right? So all three similars are accomplished by that one method. Right? So lastly, we'll do it again. The hands are wet. Right? We take the three fingers from the front all the way to the, to the back. The, side, the palms from the side to the front. The fingers in the fold inside the ear. Right, the back uh, with the thumbs, and then the back of these fingers to the back of the neck. Right, so right, it becomes easy to do uh, after a few, a few tries. Right, so all of the sunnahs are applied, uh, are, are fulfilled with that, and every individual part has its own water. Right? So the hand is wet completely. Right? Uh, otherwise, if you were to use your whole hand to wipe the head, then there might not be any water left for you to do your ears, right? And so that's just a method that the scholars have liked uh, because of its uh, ability to practically fulfill all of the all of the sunnahs in one go. All right. So the non-emphasized sunnahs of the of the uh, wudu, right? They are rewarding. And they're not. There is no sin in, in leaving them. But these are another. These are more ways to beautify uh, what we are presenting to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala of our good deeds, right? Specific, specifically the wudu. Right? So one is to face the qibla when making wudu. Right? Sometimes practically this may not be able be. This might not be very practical for many people because their their restroom or wherever the the tap is in their home, they may not be facing the qibla. Right? But if it is, then one can add this to their intention that they are doing it, right? facing the Qibla. Or if one is outside or at the masjid and some of the tabs face the Qibla and some of them don't, to choose the one that faces the Qibla and get the, get the extra reward. Right? Num so to face the Qibla, number two, right? to av avoid uh, letting the, the used water of the wudu splash back on you. Right? In the Hanafi school, the used water from wudu uh, is pure. It's not impure whatsoever, right? uh, and I believe that is the same in other schools as well. Right, but to not allow it to splash back on your body is recommended. Right? And the scholars they've mentioned uh, that one making the wudu that one should lean forward so that it doesn't drip all on their clothes. Right? And this is from the propriety right, and etiquette of the believer, right? even though it is not sinful if some of it were to drip back. Right. Right. Number three is to make the supplication, right, the du'a, right, that are narrated for each limb, right, right. But in general, to 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 mention the name of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, to keep the heart present with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala through each limb, uh, as they wash, right, as they do the whole process of the wudu. Uh, so we can share. We can try to share, inshallah. Uh, to the students, uh, maybe later on, uh, the specific du'as to make during each part. So to wash the face, to, oh Allah, make my face illuminated on the day when faces will be darkened, right? to wash the arms, oh Allah, give me my book of deeds in my right hand and do not give it to me in my left hand and so forth. Right? And these are du'as that are narrated from the early Muslims right? and they're good to do. Right? Number four, 
uh, is mentioning the name of Allah for each limb. Right? There's one instead of in the beginning, it's an emphasized sunnah to do, right, to mention the name of Allah, but to mention throughout the wudu is also right, uh, a recommended sunnah. And right, number five, to perform wudu with, by one's own doing, right? To not take assistance from other people, right? To, to wipe, right? If one is assisting by pouring, then that, that's not against this sunnah, right? But if they were to actually help you in guiding the water without necessity, if there's someone is sick or in a hospital and they need help, and that is not uh, something dis disliked. All right, number six, rushing to perform the wudu before the prayer time comes in, unless one has a chronic excuse, All right? So to perform the wudu before the time comes in is a recommendation, right? One of the great uh, righteous or early Muslims, right? they would constantly be in the masjid before the adhan for every salat. And, and some people said to him, why do you come so early? And he said that I want to be a good slave. The good slave is the one who comes and says, is there anything that I can do? Right? Whereas the bad slave has to be called. <laughs> and the, many of the Sahaba, they would, they would make wudu either right away as the adhan came in or even before that. Right? Except for the one who has a chronic, chronic excuse because uh, as far as the validity of their wudu, they have to wait till the prayer time comes in. Uh, and the last two is right, reciting the the, test, the two testifications of faith, the shahadatain, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah, right after making the wudu, right, and to make the dua of the after wudu, right, Allah majalni min al tawabin, majalni min al bahirin, majalni min barik al salihin, right, and there's a few duas as well. Uh, lastly, and, and that, that's the, the last of them, he does mention drinking from the leftover water afterwards. That, that would only apply if you were using a vessel to drink from or to take from. Uh, if one wished, they could take some of the water from the tap, right? With having the sunnah in mind as a, a means to try to apply the sunnah. But if one is making wudu from a vessel, right, then to drink afterwards. Right, what the water that has not been used, the leftover water, right, and this goes back to not wasting. Right, the Prophet he he did not waste water, right, and Imam Ibn Ruslan, one of the great Shafi'i scholars, he mentions in his poem Matan Zubad, uh, that even if one is making wudu out of an, right, an ocean from the ocean, right, they should still not waste water. Okay, so uh, Will Parles there. Uh, the next thing he talks about is those things which are disliked in the prayer, right? And, and we'll talk about that there's different levels of dis dislike. Some of it right, is just merely against what is recommended, right? But others could, could possibly end up being sinful if they're, if they're egregious. Uh, so we'll stop there. We want to try to make way on this because we have a lot to cover and we don't have too many time, too much time, too many classes. Uh, we can leave the last 10 minutes of the, the session, inshallah, for questions, uh, if anyone has questions. Uh, preferably uh, related to the topic, but if there are no other questions, then even if it's not related to the topic, but having to do with the you know, Hanafi. Uh, if there are no questions, then we can continue this last small section. Could you provide some brief context on medhabs in general terms? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, meaning uh, regarding the following of schools of thought, following of methods. Okay. Uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, we wanted to preface the class with that, but uh, for the sake of time, we didn't. Uh, the idea of the medhab 
the, the school of thoughts in, in Islam uh, is that the school that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he revealed in the Quran guidance right? and the Prophet Islam teaches us guidance. Right? But it is from the divine wisdom right, that certain things were not uh, made extremely specific. Right? Some things are very specific, right? That's a Qurabuzina, do not even come close to fornication. Right? But whereas other things are indicated by the text, they're not specifically mentioned in the text. Right? And, and in interpreting such texts of such depth and, and eloquence, right, the scholars have differed. And this was allowed in the time of the Prophet some the Sahaba themselves different uh, about different meanings. Right? And this is part of the organic nature of one's relationship with Allah SWT, that it's not just uh, following black and white rules, right, but also, right, applying one's intellect and thinking how what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want and that's the beauty of, of the deen right so the great scholars right, thousands of years of scholarships where they have preserved not only the letter of the law but the spirit of the law in their right, legal legal understanding right so the school really right, it's not a set of rules but it's a method of of deriving rulings from from the sacred texts Right, it's a method. How do we approach ambiguous verses? How do we approach right, seemingly contradicting hadith? Right? How do we approach right? seemingly being the, right, the important word there? Right? Because things taken on their outward right, is not uh, that the Quran is, is deeper than just superficial wording. Right? It's deep meaning behind it. Right? So the school is the method that one approaches those texts how do they understand those texts right and and that has been done by the scholars right so the and it is there's a con consensus in the ummah right that imam abu hanifa imam shafi imam ahmed bahambu imam malik alayhim rahmatullahi ta'ala right are the aim al mujtahideen they are the uh, the imams right and they are all valid scholars right and and they all have their own individual interpretive method to the Quran and the Hadith. And because they differed on the method, right, sometimes the results differ, but you'll find that the difference of opinion between them is very little. Right? And it was, it was known by all, all of the early Muslims that ikhtilaf al-ummati rahmah, that that difference of opinion is a mercy. Right? And anybody who has spent extensive time answering questions related to, right, to fiqh and law, Right, you are on. It's it's very clear that that difference of opinion is so merciful, right, for this ummah. Because if everything was only one way, black and white, right, then many people who have very special, unique circumstances would be in complete hardship. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Ma alaykum dini min He has not placed upon you in your religion any undue hardship. Right. So it is part of the principles of our religion to remove that hardship. And by taking the opinion of a valid, right, authentic, authoritative source, like another madhab, like the imam, other imams, right, there's nothing wrong with that. Right, as long as it's not done by someone who doesn't have the prerequisite knowledge in order to sift through the texts. Right? So not everyone can just open the Quran and say what they want. Right? There has to be that chain of transmission to the Prophet Right? And it has to be pre prerequisite knowledge in order to do that. So to go to a, a an expert mufti, right? But there are many wisdoms behind that. Uh, is wiping the ears a sunnah? Yes, the wiping of the ears is is considered an emphasized sunnah uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. Right. And and the ears are wiped with the same water. Right, that one uses to wipe the head. You don't have to take new water. Right. Question. I have a question in regards to women and makeup. Right. Does it have to be completely removed prior to wudu? Okay, I, I believe this is coming later, but this is important now, so we'll talk about it. Uh, one of the conditions of a wudu to be valid right, is that anything that would prevent water from reaching the places that we mentioned or reaching the face or reaching the arms or the right or, or re reaching the feet right anything that would prevent the water from reaching has to be removed beforehand because if something 
blocks the water from reaching the skin under it, then that part is as if it's not washed. And if any, even one sha'ra, even a hair, right, as in, mentioned in the hadith, right, is left, then it's, that remains invalid. Right? As we mentioned before, that the general principle is that water reaches even the most difficult places. Right? So, some, so the thing must actually be a, a clear preventative of the water to reach the skin. Right, so for instance, like uh, like plaster or paint, right, right, uh, like uh, paint or uh, what, like uh, the question is regarding makeup. Uh, one thing that that does is uh, paint-based uh, nail polish. Paint-based nail polish, right, prevents the water, right. Rather, but things like ink lotion, cream, oil, these do not prevent the water from reaching the skin, right? So if, if one had ink-based uh, uh, nail polish, then that would not break the skin. That would not be a barrier to the skin, right? If one had henna, right, after it's peeled off, right, then that, that ink does not break, does not prevent the water from reaching the skin, right? But things like if one had dough right, stuck under their fingernails after cooking some bread or something, right? Or they had right, wax right, or, or white out, right? White out is a common one, paint, right? Then that would prevent, they would have to remove that first and then wash it. If they washed their limb first and then they realized they would just have to remove that and then wash that spot again and their wudu is complete. Right, I hope that answers the question. Uh, I'm sure more of this will come up soon, inshallah, when we get to also. Uh, I, I believe we have time for one or two more questions. And then we'll pause for today. And, right. As things come, and inshallah, please write down your questions uh, if so that you don't forget. In the next class, we'll try to leave some time as well, uh, possibly even in the beginning to take some questions from the last class. Right. Also, we'll try to have some sort of uh, avenue that questions can be sent in as well if they don't have to do with the, the topic at hand just for the sake of time and to give everyone their their due rights Mashallah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to teach us that which he wants from us and to give us the divine facilitation to apply that to our lives and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to increase us in that knowledge, beneficial knowledge, knowledge that is coupled with action. And, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to teach us our own faults and to allow us to focus only on our own faults and not to focus on other people's faults. And that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify us outwardly and inwardly so that our hearts become pleasing to him and that we are raised in a day of judgment amongst those with pure hearts. Waqal bin Salim, those who come with pure hearts. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to guide us, to make us firm on the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.